Okay, let's discuss the finer points of disease eradication versus disease management. One basic truth we should all be able to agree on, fish diseases exist in the ocean so they will make their way into our aquariums, since most of the fish we keep still come directly from the ocean. But you may ask yourself this, why aren't fish in the ocean wiped out by, say, ick and velvet? There are two reasons. First is dilution. It keeps the overall number of parasites very low. By contrast, parasites, worms, and other pathogens propagate at much higher concentrations in the confines of a small glass box that we call an aquarium. The fish literally have nowhere to get away from the parasites. Secondly, fish in the ocean eat all day long and generally speaking get much better nutrition than what we provide them with. Thus, their immune systems are stronger and more adept at fighting off pathogens. What does disease eradication mean? It means doing everything possible to keep fish diseases out of your display tank. Most people accomplish this by quarantining their fish prior to them entering the display tank. Some choose to prophylactically treat their fish for the most commonly encountered diseases, while others prefer to just observe and only treat if symptoms of a disease are noticed. Both strategies can work depending upon your attention to detail and available free time to watch fish in quarantine. For those who are always on the go, have a busy, hectic schedule, or just don't notice the little things, it would be wise to adopt some form of prophylaxis when it comes to diseases. Now, what does disease management mean? That means accepting the possibility or likelihood that diseases will eventually be present in the display tank. This method involves just managing the presence of diseases instead of eradicating them. You know you have ick or velvet, etc. in your tank, or you are willing to frisk it by foregoing quarantine. A lot of successful hobbyists employ this method, and I'm going to share with you exactly how they do it. So, let's start with what treats what. First off, all of the medications discussed here should only be used in a quarantine tank, never in your display tank. Copper is the most commonly used treatment for ick and velvet. There are alternative medications which can be used to treat both, including chloroquine, different variations of tank transferred method, and hyposalinity treats ick only. I like to show the difference between ick and velvet using the same species of fish, in this case a hippo tang. The one on the left with the larger white dots has ick, whereas the one on the right with numerous smaller white dots and cloudy eyes has velvet. Typically, if you can count the white dots on a fish, it's usually ick. However, if they are too numerous to count, there's a good chance you are dealing with velvet. Formalin is the treatment of choice for Brooklynella, however, it can only be used as a preventative for uronema. This is because it burns the red sores typically seen in advanced stages of uronema. Once this happens, prognosis is bleak, and unless you are willing to try experimental treatments, the fish should be humanely euthanized. Clownfish are most susceptible to Brooklynella, whereas Chromis and sometimes Antheus are primarily afflicted by uronema. Saltwater flukes are translucent and thus difficult to see on a fish. However, they drop off and turn white, as seen on left, when a fish is given a freshwater dip. So this is the best way to confirm that a fish has skin flukes. However, gill flukes are much smaller and won't always dislodge during a freshwater dip. So you must rely upon behavioral symptoms to tell if a fish has these. A fish with gill flukes may exhibit yawning, head twitching, and scratching targeting the gill area. Tubularians primarily afflict tangs and will look like dark dots on the fish. The good news is that Prozipro usually eliminates both. Antibiotics treat bacterial infections, which usually present as red marks or white film on a fish, or cloudy eyes as seen at bottom right. Bacterial infections are sometimes secondary to a pre-existing parasitic or worm infestation, due to the fish's immune system already being compromised from fighting off parasites or worms. Poor water quality, open wounds, and nutritional deficiency are all possible contributing factors of these infections. Okay, so the diseases I have touched upon is not a comprehensive list by any means. They are just the most commonly encountered fish diseases and how to treat them. Other diseases can pop up, which is why a post-treatment observation period is so important before placing fish in your display tank. I generally recommend a two to four week observation period 
and non-medicated water to watch and see if any other diseases surface. Now comes the really bad news. As you will see from the diagram in the center, ick, for example, spends more time off the fish than on it. The parasites drop off after three to seven days and then look for any hard surface to insist upon before releasing free swimmers into the water column, which seek out more fish to infect. A study done by Dr. Peter Burgess in 1992 proved that tomones can adhere to rock, substrate, snail shells, the exoskeleton of a crustacean, non-tissue parts of corals, any hard surface really. The only way to negate this threat is by isolating any coral or invert to a fishless environment, typically a frag tank, for a predetermined amount of time. Usually six weeks is recommended. The absence of fish in this aquarium will literally starve the parasites to death and break the life cycle. So, a lot of you are probably thinking right now, I don't want to have to go through all that. There must be another way. There is, but it's a lot riskier because you can't control all the different variables because you aren't limiting what goes into your tank. Some people are very successful with disease management, while for others it ends in disaster. The best strategy for employing disease management is to recreate conditions which allows fish to live with pathogens in the wild. This is a very simple concept in theory. The key to success is this, keeping the overall number of parasites down while simultaneously boosting your fish's immune systems to deal with the parasites that survive. Keeping the overall number of parasites down is primarily achieved via mechanical filtration. The goal is to keep free swimmers and other parasites and worms to a sublethal concentration, as normally occurs in the ocean. This helps to prevent your fish's immune system from being overwhelmed by them. A UV sterilizer works by siphoning out and then killing via UV light pathogens such as ick and velvet free swimmers in the water. Ozone oxidizes and kills pathogens directly in the water column, on rocks, and on the surface of the substrate. However, too much ozone in the water can be dangerous to your fish, corals, and inverts. A diatom filter works the same as a UV, except it traps parasites, worms, and bacteria in diatomaceous earth. You can also use a fine micron filter with a diatom to capture pathogens. An oxidator utilizes hydrogen peroxide to infuse more dissolved oxygen into the water. It has been likened to putting an oxygen mask on a sick fish. The thought process behind using an oxidator and other disease management tools is you are buying a diseased fish more time for its immune system to kick in and fend off whatever pathogens are afflicting the animal. If a fish can survive the initial wave of parasites or worms, usually acquired immunity and or resistance begins to occur. Peroxide dosing is more a way of dealing with an emergency situation than an ongoing disease management technique. Anecdotal evidence has shown that dosing peroxide over a six week period can possibly eliminate velvet, brooklinella, and uranema from your aquarium. However, this strategy doesn't always work and sometimes corals inverts are negatively impacted by the peroxide in the water. Okay, so you've got the parasite population under control by running a UV or employing some other disease management tool. The problem is that none of these will completely eliminate all of the parasites. A more realistic expectation is just to keep the parasites down to a sublethal concentration. So, what we have to do next is boost your fish's immune systems to deal with whatever parasites survive. The best way to accomplish this is by boosting your fish's gut microbiota and immune system through proper nutrition. I personally am a fan of feeding live foods in high quality frozen and also nori. You can buy already packaged frozen food, such as made by LRS Foods, or make your own. Frozen foods I recommend include mysa shrimp, clams, oysters, scallops, callinus, perch, white fish, and fish eggs. If you do make your own fish food, I recommend adding probiotics to it. Now, there is a biosecurity risk from feeding frozen seafood because the freezing process doesn't always kill all bacteria and viruses. So for those who want to play it absolutely safe, I recommend using a high quality pe pellet food such as TDO Chroma Boost. 
I also recommend utilizing fish vitamins such as Vitachem or Celcon. In addition, soaking fish food in beta-glucan is a great way to boost the fish's immune system. There are some other common sense precautions you can take to turn the odds more in your favor when it comes to disease management. First, stay on top of your aquarium husbandry. Maintain pristine water conditions, stable parameters, and avoid fish that are likely to fight. Poor water quality, fluctuating parameters, and aggression from other fish may stress a fish out, lowering his immune system and making him more susceptible to disease. Secondly, choose your fish wisely. Avoid fish which are known to be more prone to disease. Examples include angels, butterflies, and tangs. And instead, stock fish which are typically more disease resistant. Uh, examples of these are blennies, cardinal fish, clownfish, gobies, rabbit fish, and most wrasses. Do your homework and research fish that have thick mucus or slime coats that protect their skin from attacking parasites. Also, only buy from reputable sources. And don't buy fish that look diseased or damaged, won't eat, or who share water with diseased fish. Remember, most local fish shops have their tanks all plumbed together. No discussion of disease management can be had without mentioning garlic. This topic is often debated, but there is some recent scientific evidence that garlic was able to help marginally control marine ick. I have seen it work as an appetite stimulant, so that might help right there. Another theory is that garlic leaches back out of a fish's pores, which makes them an undesirable host for parasites and worms. A medicated bath is better than no quarantine at all and may knock off enough parasites to lower the parasite load once the fish goes directly into your display tank. Both formalin and hydrogen peroxide can be used in baths and are effective at treating marine velvet disease, brooklinella, uronema, and flukes. However, you'll want to use one or the other, not both. After the formalin or peroxide bath, you can give a fish a 30-minute methylene blue bath it treats ammonia burn, abrasions, cuts, and open wounds. Methylene blue contains mild antiparasitic, antibacterial, and antifungal properties. It's probably one of the best first response treatments for a sick fish. It will also possibly detoxify a fish that has been exposed to cyanide poisoning. Directions for using these three medications in a bath can be found on my forum. Thank you for allowing me to present this information.